minute session planned for you. To start with, we're talking about life cycle assessment of low carbon walking cold rooms. Um, next up, we'll have energy access and appliances in humanitarian settings. The third session is going to be around solar dryers. And the final session will be around powering jobs, phase two, how decentralised renewable energy technologies can unlock on-farm and off-farm farm employment. So I'm sure there'll be something for everyone. But before we start, just a few bits of housekeeping. Uh, the format is an interactive discussion. Uh, we're really keen to hear your thoughts and discussions. But during the presentations, if you wouldn't mind, please keep your microphones on mute. That would be really appreciated. At the end of each presentation, you can unmute yourself to ask any questions, or you can put them into the chat if you prefer. At the end of each presentation, you're very welcome to stay on if you'd like to have an extended chat with the presenters, or you can move on to the next presentation using the links which we will be putting into the chat. Finally, we will be recording the session um, purely for note taking purposes. So without further ado, I will now hand over to Naya Abagi from Efficiency for Access, who's going to be our moderator for the first session. Thank you, Anita. Um, and hi, everyone. Good morning, good afternoon, wherever you're calling in from. Thank you so much for joining us today um, for this research expo. We have an exciting afternoon um, lined up for you. Um, and so just to start by giving a little bit of background um, and introduction to the Efficiency for Access Coalition. Um, so it's a global coalition that aims to promote high quality energy efficient appliances as a way to boost incomes, reduce carbon emissions and improve quality of life. Um, our focus really is on the off and weak grid areas. Um, so making sure that we are serving a lot of consumers who will likely be left behind um, and the business as usual um, activities. Um, so the coalition is jointly coordinated by CLASP um, and UK's Energy Saving Trust. Um, and our core funding comes um, from IKEA Foundation as well as the UK Aid through the Transforming Energy Access Platform. Um, so if you're wondering what does this, all this mean and why should we care? Because solar appliances um, today um, are very important for meeting cooling, agriculture, in, uh, agricultural needs, improving livelihoods, reducing drudgery. But currently they only serve about 1% of the obtain obtainable market. So really urgent um, and concerted effort is needed from all stakeholders. Um, so thank you so much for taking the time to join us today. Um, so now I will hand it over to our first presenters, um, Victor and Stuart, who will be walking us through the life cycle assessment of low carbon walk-in cold rooms. Over to you. Thank you very much, Niamolo, for the introduction. Also, welcome from my side. My name is Victor Torres, a founder from Solar Cooling Engineering in Germany. And uh, me, together with uh, Stuart, uh, we are going to drive you through the, a project we have in common uh, for the life cycle assessment of a low carbon working cold room. And if we'll go to the next slide, I think efficiency exactly here. Uh, so the project is about developing a, a concept for a solar power cold room that has a minimum a carbon footprint um, and also including the pilot testing of this. Uh, the project is founded by, by VETU, which is a social enterprise based in Kenya, in Kisumu, uh, focused on offering services like uh, clean water, um, solar lights, um, and uh, cooling as a service. And it's also founded by a research and development grant from Efficiency for Access. Uh, we from Solar Cooling Engineering are coordinating the project uh, in cooperation with uh, SelfChill, which is a brand for modular cooling solutions, uh, JOM, which is an architectural um, office in Switzerland that is supporting the green building concept of the cold room, and the University of Sheffield uh, with Stua uh, Walker for the um, uh, life cycle assessment or the assessment of carbon emissions of each component. Next slide, please. So first of all, I would like to let you know a little bit about the self seal approach, which is an approach to uh, be able to uh, locally manufacture uh, solar power cold rooms. And I would like just to show you here an example of uh, two cold rooms that are not the slide before, please. <laughs> 
So it's a, con a concept for modular, uh, modular call rooms which are uh, made locally. Uh, here you see an example of a call room in Kenya that is at the moment also operated by uh, Vetsu uh, with conventional uh, polyurethane sandwich panels as insulation. Uh, uh, here you see another one, which is a, con a containerized solution with um, uh, the solar panels on top. Uh, the values of self seal is uh, to support the, the local production, the local manufacturing, also to uh, promote the use of uh, low global warming refrigerants and, and thermal storage. Uh, there are 19 uh, solar coal rooms already pilot in eight countries. So after these uh, projects that we had, we decided to even increase the um, sustainability of these kind of coal rooms. And if we go to the next slide, let me see if I can also, uh, sorry for this. <laughs> now I have to delete everything. I hope it works better now. Um, so what we uh, did on, on the first step is to substitute the polyurethane sandwich panels that are typically, typically used for uh, the cold cell. Uh, we are substituting them by uh, biogenic uh, materials. Um, in our case, we are using basically timber and straw as insulation material. So here you see an example on how these elements are, are produced. Uh, we had already a mock-up uh, going on in Kisumu where we have tested six different uh, concepts of the elements with vapor barrier, with ecobots, with different um, uh, construction types. And here uh, you can see our final uh, selection. We use a timber as a structure, a straw as an insulation material, and then on the outside, a wall we use echo boards that are uh, not allowing humidity to go in inside the coal room and in the inside wall uh, we use a uh, timber uh, plates uh, and the uh, TNG uh, concept. In the next slides you can have a look uh, how the concept, the overall concept works. Um, so it's of course a run 100% uh, on solar energy, it is an off-grid uh, site. The uh, PV panels uh, run uh, DC cooling units, so we don't need here inverters. Uh, you see here the, the compressors of the cooling units, they are connected uh, through a charge controller and batteries as a conventional solar home system. Uh, then we have a thermal storage and ice storage inside the cold room. So here ice is created during, during the day. And then the cold water here are at around two degrees is circulated via a, a water pump uh, into a fan coil, as you can see here, uh, that uh, makes out of the cold water, cold air. Uh, the cold room is operating at around 10 degrees, uh, but the temperature can be, of course, uh, modified. And here on the right, you can see the agricultural products. Um, another innovation that we have here is the use of a charcoal. Uh, so that we can make use of evaporative cooling to increase the coefficient of performance of the cooling units uh, during the day. So the, um, the, the efficiency of the cooling units is higher uh, through the evaporative cooling energy. Um, what I would like to say, you are probably wondering, we have batteries. It, um, it's not a full 100% battery-free system. This has the reason to make the overall system more sustainable to decrease uh, the carbon emissions of the concept. I will show you more in the next slide. Uh, yes, here. Uh, we were asking ourselves at the beginning, okay, biogenic materials uh, make us reduce the uh, carbon impact a lot, but what can we do with uh, batteries, PV, um, and, and so on, how, how to deal with this? And what we have found out is that when you don't have a thermal storage, then you normally need to have big batteries to have a certain autonomy of the cold room. And what is very interesting is if you do a battery-free system, uh, then uh, your problem is because you don't have electrical batteries, you do everything on thermal storage, then you need to oversize the PV system, you need more PV panels, and this negatively affect uh, the carbon footprint. And that's why we decided at the end of the day to go for a hybrid system that has 
not only thermal storage, it has also a small batteries that are able to uh, use better the, the solar energy provided by the panels, reducing the surplus energy, and in overall, needing less panels that make the uh, carbon footprint uh, lower. So if we go now to the next slide, please. Um, there, there is a the, the pilot of this cold room is um, scheduled now for for July 24. So we are about to start. Uh, the cold room will be installed in Homa Bay at the marketplace. It will be operated by by Vetu, and the, the financial model of cooling as a service. Um, um, cooling down and storing agricultural produce uh, overnight for uh, traders uh, that are using this service, uh, as I said, and the uh, cooling as a service financial model. Next slide, please. Here, I would like to show you um, an animation of the cold room concept so that you can see um, how it is built. Could you? Exactly, now it's running. So we are using stones as a foundation, uh, also for sustainability reasons. Um, here you see the insulation uh, panels made of uh, biogenic materials. Then you see here a hole that is done for the cooling units, uh, which are heat pumps. They are the compressors and condensed units are outside. There you saw the um, thermal storage and the fan coil. On top, uh, we have an structure uh, for the PV panels, as you are going to see in a, min in a minute. Uh, this is also collecting raining water um, because uh, we have also a, a green building concept. Here you see the charcoal uh, and the batteries. Um, here we are collecting the raining water because we are using this water also to have vegetation around the cold room, also to reduce uh, the thermal losses. That's the uh, that's the reason. And uh, with this, I would like to hand over um, to my colleague Stuart Wolka from the University of Sheffield that will drive you through uh, the life cycle assessment itself. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank, Thank you, you so much, Victor. Um, Stuart, before you go, I just want to give you a time check. Um, yes. If you can try to wrap it up in maybe seven minutes so that we can leave some time at the end for Q&A. Okay, start my stopwatch. Yeah. Okay, yes, thank you, Victor. So yeah, hello, everybody. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit in a bit more detail about the, the life cycle assessment specifically. Um, so I'm going to cover, first of all, what is life cycle assessment? So first of all, to, to cover the acronym, we might call it LCA. So life cycle assessment, sometimes called life cycle analysis. Um, uh, why do life cycle assessment? We'll talk about uh, a tool that we developed specific to this cold room. Um, and then we'll talk a little bit about biogenic carbon and what that means and how we include that in life cycle assessment. So um, if we just go to the next slide, please. So this is uh, the graph in the middle there is, is from a previous life cycle assessment uh, that was done that, that gave us a really good kind of basis for, for looking at how we could um, how we could reduce the overall impact on this this um, low impact um, cold room, basically. So so we, you can see the, the batteries and the refrigerants and the blowing agents are, are factors that were particularly um, that if, if we basically make incorrect um, or, or less sustainable choices there, they have a really big impact on the on the overall total. Um, of the of the impact of the cold room, so we'll see in a minute. But first of all, just to cover kind of what exactly what life cycle assessment is. So it's a without going into too much kind of detail, it's a it's a tool that allows us to look at. So if we take this cold room for, for as an example, it allows us to look at every element of the cold room. So the the PV panels, the construction, the the timber, the everything that we've used, but also all the everything within that. So within the PV panels, we're looking at the the silicon, the wafers that are used there, how those are how those are produced, how those are cut, how they're transported, everything that goes into to manufacturing these products, um, and it allows us to look at their impact, um, both in in greenhouse gas emissions, so so carbon footprint as we as we often do, but also in in a number of other impact categories. So, for example, we can look at things like um, like water use or land use or or other factors like that. So that's not the that's not the land use of the cold room in operation. It's the land use that is required to to grow or to develop the, the products that then go into the cold room. So if we're using lots of straw, for example, then there is an element of land use because land is required to grow the straw in order for us to, to produce that crop to go into. So we, we need to we need to consider that um, alongside the, the carbon footprint. 
But yeah, these, the results from this previous study allowed us to kind of see that there is definitely some some potential in our cold room. So then we we carried on and did a, a specific life cycle assessment for that. So if we could go to the next slide, please. So one really important thing in this cold room is, is the way that we've used um, natural materials, uh, which are often called biogenic materials. So I'm sure maybe people are aware of this, but this just to give a bit of quick background. So these are materials that that as they grow, they photosynthesize. So it's anything that, that grows, anything that's a, a crop that can grow. Um, as it grows, it, it absorbs um, absorbs carbon dioxide from the air. Um, and that carbon is, is stored within, um, within the, the cells of the natural products. Uh, and that's called biogenic carbon. So that's stored. If you imagine a tree, as it grows, it, it absorbs that over its lifetime. And that carbon is then stored within the tree. Um, so we need to, we can, if we use those materials, that's great because that means that the that those materials have that stored carbon within them. Um, so we avoid that carbon being being released by the, the if the wood was burned, for example, then the, the carbon would be released to the atmosphere. Or if it was um, buried or just let it rot, it would it would over a slower period of time, but that, that carbon would still um, would still eventually be released. Whereas if we build something out of that material, we first of we do two things. We first of all avoid, so if we build something out of wood, we avoid having to use metal. So we avoid the emissions that would be associated with um, with the manufacture and with the, the manufacture of the metal. Um, we still have some emissions associated with, for example, cutting our wood and, and um, you know, planing our wood and making our wood into a, into a product that we can actually use. But we also benefit from the, the carbon that, that was stored in that wood. It remains locked up inside the, inside the product, so effectively inside the structure of the cold room. Um, so next slide, please. So here we can just see just very quickly that comparison in, in terms of a graph. So if we look at the um, the red dotted line is a, a kind of a fossil based material or a, a conventional, basically any non biogenic material. So you can see as it starts its life at, at, the, at the left hand side, um, it has a certain amount of emissions within the material. So those are the emissions that are required to, to maybe to mine it or to refine it or to produce it or, or whatever. Um, then there are some more emissions associated with manufacturing. So as we go through that manufacturing process, we, we incur some more emissions. Through the use phase, the emissions stay stay level because we don't add any more emissions and then at the end of life there are some more emissions as we as we um as we dispose of that product so that ends up this is just indicative but that red line ends up relatively high whereas if we go back to the beginning and look at the green line with a biogenic material see as it grows it absorbs co2 so it has a, a negative um emissions um and then that that's that product then then lives its life we then harvest it which uses some emissions so we we basically reduce the amount that we have stored by using some other emissions in a, in a net sense uh, and then the same in manufacturer in manufacturing sorry we we use a little bit more but then during the use phase you can see we're still below the line so we basically have a, a biogenic material that's storing some carbon during its lifetime then when it eventually reaches the end of its life if assuming it isn't reused, then those emissions will will eventually be released. But by by using this material in something like a cauldron that might have quite a long lifetime, we we store that carbon for a long period of time and, and stop it being released, um, which which is good for both good for the, the carbon emissions and also a good a good material to use. Okay, next slide, please. So I mentioned that we developed a tool um, in this um, in this project. So I think if we click again, we should start to see the mouse move around and you can have a look at the tool here. So just quickly, um, we've got various options in here, but we developed this tool that allows us to, to compare various options for how we build the cold room. So you can see, um, for example, we can we can adjust what the type of the eco boards from plastic to timber. And um, we can look just where we are now. We can compare between um, EPS insulation and straw insulation, uh, and the tool automatically updates the, the emissions, um, the net emissions that we've got at the top there. We can adjust the refrigerant type, um, we can adjust where we are now, the, the battery type, um, and we can also adjust the, um, the solar panel type, as we'll see a little bit further on. Um, and you can see in the graph on the right hand side, the, the, um, the cumulative total that we're getting from, from those various parts. Um, okay, so if we just skip on a few, I think there's some red boxes, but if we just skip on to, uh, so yeah, we can see this, there's various sections of the tool, but I think if we, if we press on through those, please. Yeah, uh, technical area, and then I think there's one more, and then we'll have the next slide, please. Okay, so as a result of this uh, of using the tool and and for the for the um, the cold room that Victor talked about and that you saw in the in the animation, this is this is the kind of result that we get basically. So you can see. Um, as we go down, there, there are some things that have obviously the emissions are, are caused. There are some things that have positive uh, and negative emissions. So the timber boards, there's a positive emission due to the manufacturing processes. But there's a negative emission due to the biogenic storage. Similarly, the insulated panels, there's a negative emission because it's, it's straw, it's a biogenic material. 
there's a positive emission because of the processing of the straw and the, and the manufacture and things. One thing that really jumps out here is how important the PV is. So as Victor mentioned, by having um, by having batteries, we reduce the amount of PV we need. So in total for the cold room, we can, we can reduce the, the total compared to what it would be. Okay, so next slide, please. So this gives us the the total from the from this this type of cold room. So we we get um, a total of around two and a half tons of of CO two emissions um, net for this cold room. So we essentially the the structure of the cold room, so the the building as it were, is is um, the bio, the emissions of that are offset by the biogenic emissions, but then the technical elements have their own emissions. So we end up with a with a net a net emission of of two point five tons, which is um, as we've seen, other previous cold rooms are somewhere in the region of kind of between two and twenty tons of CO two for a for a similarly sized cold room. Uh, so you can see we're, we're, we've got quite a lot um, quite a lot lower emissions for this um, for this type of cold room. Um, if we just go on again, please. We also looked at a few other impacts. Um, so we can see, um, for example, as I mentioned, land use, water use, and, and toxicity um, are just examples of, a, of, of of tens that we could look at. So I think if we go to one more, we'll see some some trade offs. Yeah. So we can see here if we compare our cold room, the biogenic cold room, on on in the um, yeah on the left hand side, the, the technical and the structure elements, to a conventional cold room on the right, uh, we can see that for for CO two e, so for for greenhouse gas emissions, which is on the top, you can see we. We perform a lot better for water use. Um, again, we, we perform a, quite a bit better. Still some water use in, in the growing of the crops. And then next slide, please. Uh, and in the, the, the graph at the top there, that's a human toxicity indicator. So we, we perform somewhat better there than the, than the conventional cold room. Um, but I just put this, these kind of trade-offs in to show that, you know, that sometimes there are, there are kind of choices to be made. So, and this is where life cycle assessment is really useful because it shows us a range of a range of factors. So we can see that for land use, our, our emissions are, are higher than the conventional cold room. And that's due to the, the growing of the straw and the timber. Um, there's more kind of nuance and detail that we don't have time to talk about today there because we can, if a, if a crop is grown and part of it is used by us or, or a, a part that would otherwise be a waste product, then arguably there's, those emissions aren't entirely attributed to our, um, to our product or there's a balance between whether it, there's a food crop and then a waste crop. And then if we can use that waste crop, um, then, then the emissions aren't necessarily a problem. But for things like land use, we do have to be very mindful of, of um, avoiding kind of any conflict, obviously, with, with growth and um, crops that are grown for, for food and anything like that. Okay, I think if we go to the next slide, we're about finished. Yeah, so the next steps um, are to, to obviously build the cold room, which, as Victor mentioned, is, is happening anytime soon. Um, update the model with, with manufacturing detail. Um, we're working with, with Wageningen and um, University and Research on some food waste calculations, which will be a really interesting part of this. Um, and then, as you can see, they're published and then, and then operate the cold room and, and refine our model as we go on. Um, and I think the final slide is just a thank you to everybody who's been involved so far. Uh, yeah, so you can see that some some names at the bottom there. I've just seen a message pop up, so I can't read them all. But, uh, but yeah, um, Francis, who did all the anima animations, um, Humphrey, um, Stefan, and everybody else who's been involved in the project. Um, so, yeah, look forward to any questions anybody has. Um, thank you so much, Stuart and Victor. This was an incredibly engaging um, presentation. I think you've done such a good job in distilling such technical research into easily digestible and also like the animations and video were, were pretty amazing. We've just been talking about it offline. Um, I think I'll start with the questions. Uh, you know, I think the use of local materials has a lot of positives, right? Uh, localizing supply chains, I think we all recognize that needs to happen quickly. Um, and I think that, you know, the your use of straw belts is particularly interesting. I personally quite like that, like earthy, natural aesthetic, um, but it is also bound to attract a lot of pests. <laughs> so I'm just wondering how you manage uh, pest control with, uh, with the use of uh, natural materials like straw belts. Uh, yeah, do you want to take that one, Victor? Or I think we've we've mostly dealt with it by by sealing the straw bales in very securely, haven't we? And, um, but yeah, I'll let you answer that one in detail. Exactly. Yeah, that's um, the most important is that um, um, the straw has a, a little moisture content while it is built, and then it is important that the humidity uh, cannot condense in the inside wall, in the interior wall of the cold room. So we did some testing for this. So we had concepts that were not working at, at all, and were making the straw more and more, more humid. And other concepts were able to 
uh, allow the vapor to go outside, I mean, to the interior of the cold room so that the humidity, the moisture content of the straw doesn't increase. And then the straw is safe uh, under the, the litter too. There are uh, 13 constraints for that and we are fulfilling that. And um, the timber is covered by eco boards uh, so that we are also safe uh, by that. Uh, on this concept, uh, local architects are working and also local carpenters with experience on, on green building. So that's uh, how we are addressing this. Thanks so much for that. Um, I see Isaiah followed up with a question about uh, termites. Um, so how do you deal with termites and rats and other rodents that would be interested in eating that tasty dried food? <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, there is a, a treatment that the timber gets uh, when it's uh, outside and the rest of the timber uh, inside the structure of the elements, it is covered by, by eco boards, uh, which are made out of a uh, recyclable uh, plastic uh, so that um, they are also protected against uh, rodents and, and termites. Super, thank you. Um, I'll take the question from Russell next. Um, so he uh, typed in the chat and he'd like to get some indication about the cost um, or performance versus mm -hmm. the current uh, quote unquote standard design. Yes, it, that's a very interesting question that we are we're making ourselves also the whole time. So for example, as you saw from Stuart, uh, the PV panels are the most driving uh, carbon footprint element or component. But is uh, in terms of cost the 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 less expensive one, so to say. So if we will design on cost cost optimization, we will design differently. We will mm -hmm. probably have more PV, uh, less batteries. We'll probably have less insulation, um, and and so on. But I can say in overall, when you when you analyze the whole cost of the of the cold room, we cannot say that we are more expensive. Um, for example, the cold cell, um, based on our uh, on, on on the estimations that we have so far, we will be around thirty percent uh, more cost efficient than a polyurethane sandwich panels. And then um, because we insulate more, we need less cooling units, we need less batteries, less PV. Uh, so it's just another, another design. So it is difficult to compare one by one, uh, but we can uh, say that we have been considering also the cost uh, during the design and we are not so far away from the, uh, from the cost, cost optimization or the co cost optimal. A solution, but it will it will look different. You will just spend the, the investment in other components, right? And so that's very very interesting, but also good news uh, that uh, sustainability can go along uh, cost efficiency. Yeah, absolutely, and that's that's such an important point, and I guess like goes back to you know the life cycle cost analysis assessment that you were just walking us through, right? It's not just about the upfront cost. But the, the production cost and as well as the cost of use over time and there needs to be a different conversation in how we analyze affordability and uh, and cost to the environment and also to, to people um so we are almost at time and there is a great question from jeremy um regarding the use of green screens um to lower um Green screens are so effective in lowering temperatures in cities for example um do you have any numbers on the solar gain as a result of screening. Uh, so what I'm gonna suggest is we're gonna take that question and send it to you via email because I think it'll need like a longer conversation. Um, um, Naya, so just one second. Yeah, uh, yeah, actually people are welcome to stay longer and ask the presenters the question if the presenters have time to stay back and while the next session starts in the other meeting room. Oh, amazing. Thanks for that okay. clarification, Leah. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Um, so Jeremy, uh, so just first of all, Victor and Stuart, do you have a little bit of uh, time to stay? Yes, of course. Yeah, sure. Okay, great. Um, so is it possible, because I think that we can proceed with a more interactive conversation so that I'm not the one asking all the questions. So if we can get permission to unmute um, audiences mics, um, and Jeremy, I'll call on you to please ask your question. Hi, Naya. Hi, 
Uh, Victor, yeah, really interesting to hear all this. Um, yeah, I, I just really liked this concept of the green screen, the living sunscreen, and I wonder if you had any numbers on the sort of savings you're achieving by having that screen all around the um, the unit. And I, I guess there are some design features in there that uh, you had to develop and think think carefully about in terms of air gaps and. Um, the green material damaging the surfaces, perhaps, as it grows. Um, interested to hear some thoughts on the use of that green screen. Thank you. Thank you, Jeremy. Yes. Um, so, so far, when you are considering the heat gain of a cold room, you have two things. Uh, the first one is, uh, as you know, the ambient temperature. And then when the sun is hitting one wall of the cold room, then you have heat gain because the surface of the of the, um, of, of the side of the cold room is getting hotter. And, um, and then you have also the solar radiation gain. So what we are trying to avoid is not only the sun hitting any wall of the cold room. This is what we avoid with the uh, with a green screen, uh, but also because it is vegetation, uh, decreasing the temperature around the cold room. Uh, but so far, we have designed the cold room without considering this. So the cold room is designed to work without vegetation, and we are just hoping that the vegetation is even help helping uh, to reduce the thermal losses. But we cannot uh, say at the moment <clears throat> how much this will, uh, so how 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 much less thermal losses we will have. Yeah. Um, we have the first estimation on the thermal losses of the, of the um, insulating elements, which is around two times more, has a two times higher thickness than a conventional um, sandwich panel. So we went for 300 millimeters, which will be similar to 150 millimeter sandwich panel. So it will be already a, a very well insulated a cold room. So we expect the thermal losses to be uh, to be very, very low, which has uh, turned out to be a, a very, very important investment. Um, so the a higher insulation can make the amount of components that you need for the cooling part uh, much lower. This is very uh, considerable. And it's probably worth uh, mentioning as well, Victor, that we we're monitoring um, this. As you say, we, we'll know exactly more once we've um, once this cold room is up and running. But we have some monitoring equipment in there, don't we, to to kind of update and refine and kind of build our update our model so that yeah, because it's obviously it's been designed and, and modelled and everything, but it's in some ways a, a kind of test test version as well. Isn't it? Yes, we have uh, sensors in every um, in every wall at both sides of the wall, so we will be able to. Uh, to say that, mm -hmm, to evaluate that. Um, as I have a question about the storage capacity. Um, as I do you want to add a little bit more detail to that? Yes, thank you. Uh, can you hear me? Thank you very much. Uh, we know yes, the cold yes, storage come with the uh, loading capacity like five ton, two ton, three ton. So what is maybe the capacity of this that you are planning to set up in Homa Bay? Thank you. Mm. Thank you. The capacity of the cold room is about four tons of, of products, uh, but uh, the system has been designed to um, have a maximum of around 400 kg uh, per day in, introduced in the, in the cold room. Uh, so that's also important for the design of a, a solar po a solar power cold room. You know, the cold rooms that are connected to the grid, they can consume one day much more energy than another day. Uh, but uh, here for a, a cold room with enough grid, with thermal storage, it is important also to design what is the maximum amount of products that can come, that can be introduced in the cold room at once. Uh, yes, so this is about 400 kg per day. Um, any other any other questions from the room? I think there's one more in the chat. I think there was a question from Yan. Oh, yeah. Yeah. 
Yeah, so I can take that one. So yeah, so Ian was saying um, your your uh, intervention combines two innovations: the use of biogenic material for the construction and an effective cooling system, uh, which of the which of both contributes to the, contributes most to the GHG emission reduction. So. Um, it's a good question. So I think I think relative to compared to a, a conventional cold room, um, the biggest change we've seen is in the biogenic materials. So the compared to a, a normal cold room, the the change in, in biogenic materials would be the answer that would, that contributes the most. Um, yeah. So we've the I think yeah from from my side. So this is this project has been my kind of introduction to cold rooms. So whether whether if you change from a a, a more conventional way of doing it to the way that self chill do it, I'm not sure what the what the impact in in changing that would be because because uh, obviously their equipment is already kind of um quite efficient and has been designed to reduce that impact so yeah i'm afraid i don't know what the impact would be if we from a kind of historical um old-fashioned cold room to what we have now but yeah but the the biogenic um change has been the biggest change that we've seen in this so that saves something around one and a half tons of the of the total so the total gross we have is about five tons and then with the biogenic it brings it down to around kind of two and a half maybe four tons around to two and a half okay great um uh, what uh, uh, how long did you uh, expect the total lifetime of the of the building so in the in the tool we so we have an overall lifetime of the of the cold room that we assume but we also for some components have a, a shorter lifetime um and so for some components we have a longer lifetime so for the for the cold room itself, we've assumed. Um, I think in the version I showed, we assumed twenty years that it could that it could survive. But for some of the components, we know that they'll be um, that they'll have shorter lifetimes or that they'll degrade over time. So that includes within it the replacement of some material, some components. Sorry, in a, in a shorter term. Um, I think somebody mentioned about battery degradation. So, and yeah, there's a whole yeah. We could we could have done this whole presentation just on the choice of batteries. I think so. We considered kind of battery refurbishment and what type of batteries to use yeah. and all the chemistries and things. And but yeah, so I think yeah. um, and I think as well there's a when these batteries are replaced, it may well be viable to replace them with refurbished batteries. But this time around, that wasn't a viable option. So there's there's all kinds of changes there. I think what what it was also surprising was that uh, lithium batteries were better than lead acid batteries. This was surprising us uh, because uh, lead acid batteries uh, you have also to replace more often. And in overall, uh, based on Stuart's analysis, we found out that lithium batteries are the, the better alternative. Also, uh, following other sustainable sustainability indicators. So that was uh, very new. Uh, the, the other thing that surprises us is that uh, having too much PV also increases your your carbon footprint. And we thought, okay, it's probably better to do a big thermal storage, a lot of PV and so on, but this is not the best one. And what I wanted to recall also is what was found out before this project started, that in conventional cold rooms, the most um, the, the most important uh, component to replace in terms of sustainability is the refrigerant. So to have a, a natural refrigerant with low global warming potential. So this can do uh, up to five uh, to 10 tons uh, of CO2 emissions depending on the cooling system. And uh, also the blowing agent of the uh, polyurethane use for the sandwich panel. So if the blowing agent uh, wasn't sustainable, then this can have also a very big impact, uh, up to 20 tons. Uh, so those are for sure the most important. Then we have the trade of PV battery and so on. And uh, uh, on, on, on top is the, the biogenic uh, concept, which makes then uh, not only decrease the, the carbon footprint, but also compensate with negative emissions and so on. And what is very exciting is now the comparison against sourcing the energy from the grid in Kenya. So in Kenya, the grid has a quite low um, CO2 uh, mix. Uh, this means uh, we are also looking forward and analyzing, okay, what is our energy consumption? What would have been the CO2 emissions if we would have sourced the energy from the grid? How uh, long is the payback period for carbon? with our concept because we have a 13 carbon investment on, on PV and so on, as you know. So that's going to be very, uh, very interesting. Up to now, our 
um, first estimations are that, that the carbon emissions we have now it will be uh, will be back, so to say, in around one year, even though the electricity grid in Kenya is so sustainable. Yeah, so that's uh, interesting to see. Yeah, you know, Victor, but as a Kenyan sitting in Kenya, you know, the reliability issue is always going to play against you. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, just we have... talk about it in the model <laughs> that it's not going to be, you know, maybe 50% uptime if you're lucky rural areas yeah but you would still use the bu the buffer capacity of the ice bath or uh, mm. yeah, yeah. We, we don't need the electricity grid at all but yeah. if we want to be transparent on on terms of right. sustainability we need to also compare us against a, yeah. a grid grid tight uh, system yeah, yeah. but yeah. we we are 100 yeah. solar the system is not not connected at all to the to the electricity grid I still have a nasty question. Right? Do you still have time for that? I was thinking that the, the thicker yeah. you would make the walls, the more biogenic carbon you would fix, and the more uh, you would reduce uh, greenhouse gas emissions. Did you just assume a certain thickness of the walls, or whatever did you, how did you deal with that? Stuart, would you like to? Uh, I have yeah. here also an answer, but what I found very interesting, Stuart, was our, our conversation uh, about how to contabilize the, the, the carbon capture by the timber and straw, because of course then you would, you would just do a huge insulating element, right? Yeah. Yeah, so there's a few... Yeah, I think there's a few kind of practical... I mean, you're absolutely right. In theory, if we, yeah, if we make a, the, the biggest... The biggest room with the most biogenic stuff that we can it, it would it would be better there's a i think um with the with in terms of the straw bale walls if we had them thicker and thicker we would then we would have some obviously the, the performance doesn't necessarily increase in linear, linearly but i think we would also have some some problems with the um i don't know whether we might have moisture problems or some other problems yeah. with the kind of the the construction the, the practical side of it i think um yeah i think it might be one to to experiment with a bit more but um but yeah there's a so yeah we could in theory we could we would certainly store more carbon i think we should yeah obviously we need to be kind of transparent that we yeah the emissions are the the carbon that is stored in our in our biogenic um storage is is temporarily stored assuming that at some point it's just our, our structure is disposed of um in theory some of the timber could be reused so for example if if it's a tree that would have been cut down and then would have been burnt to, to to make heat, if we then use it in the cold room and then the wood from the cold room is then used to to burn to make heat, then then that's great. Then you know we can think of that we got our our time with it for free. But it's uh, the modelling of, of what happens in the future makes it very difficult because we obviously we can't predict exactly what will happen with the biogenic material that we use. So I think if uh, yeah if we if we knew or strongly suspected that it would be used again or would have a good use at the end of its life then i think there's certainly a, a reasonable argument for for putting as much there as we can and there's a there's obviously a, a time argument as well that you know we're in a in a critical kind of period and if we can store as much biogenic carbon as we can at the moment then there's a, an argument that if we store that material for 20 years there will be better ways of dealing with it in 20 years time um we hope i don't know whether you know maybe not so much with timber but there are Certainly, there's those kind of um, arguments to stop that, to delay that release. That that has, yeah. a, has a lot of value. Um, but yeah, I think we can. Um, yeah, I can see that. I can see the question that you're getting at is why why not make it just as thick as you can and have as much biogenic yeah. material as you can. And we so we could have done that and and called it and ne you know net negative or a net zero room. I think in this one we we tried to make it. Mm comparable to a conventional cold yeah. room. So we've used yeah. the thing that goes what we what we did also is we used an optimization model uh, that was able to uh, simulate different configurations. So more thickness, less thickness, more PV, less PV, more batteries and so on. So the more thickness you have, the less PV panels you need. Yeah. Uh, but at some time it doesn't help anymore because mm. the thermal losses is yeah. just a part of the cooling demand, right? Yeah. You have yeah. also the uh, air infiltration, you have the products that need to be cooled down and so on. So then it doesn't make sense. So what we yeah. did is we had um, uh, the carbon emissions optimization uh, with this model that was able to compare 500 different configurations. So we select 
the one that was making sense on, on terms of optimization of carbon emissions and was also fitting with the, the surface that is needed for PV, for example. So if you have a very less thickness and you need more PV, so you need an additional roof uh, and, and, and so on. And we tried also to keep an eye on the cost efficiency. So if we had a, a configuration that was having similar carbon emissions, uh, then we took the cheapest one. Uh, so this was the process we have been following. Uh, but as Stuart mentioned, this discussion about uh, the negative carbon emissions of biogenic materials is at the moment a uh, very um, also, how to say, criticized because uh, yeah, you, you don't know what will happen with the with the carbon emissions. And as far as our architects uh, told us, uh, our architect in Switzerland, uh, expert on green building materials, they said they cannot use this part of carbon emissions uh, in Switzerland. They don't contabilize as a capture carbon emissions for the same reason, because otherwise everybody would just use a lot of uh, timber and biogenic materials, but wouldn't make sense. Mm -hmm. So that was a very good question. Thank you. All right, so um, uh, seeing that we there's so much interest in this topic, and obviously now you're in the deployment and testing stage, could you walk us through a little bit about the process of what we can expect and how we can get in touch with you over the next uh, couple of, I don't know, months, I guess, to get updates? I know Leah and Jakob will be supporting you very well, but it would be good to give this group an update and also broaden it to a lot more of the stakeholders, who I think would get a lot of value um, from what you were doing and also seeing the work on the ground. Um, so I guess the question is, yeah, how do we follow you for updates over the next couple of months? There, there will be a, um, so happily we, we uh, work here together with Efficiency for Access uh, um, and there will be a report, a report on, on this call room, uh, which is supposed to be done uh, I, I think at around October this year, uh, that will uh, report the design process of this cold room, also how the elements are constructed and so on. Um, and this will be uh, made, made available uh, to the public. And besides this, uh, all the partners involved in the project are, are available for, uh, for any future collaboration, our aim is to um, to be an example for future uh, solar power cold rooms uh, so that this concept can be can be reproduced also in other in other places. We're also uh, presenting quite a few of us at the um, at a conference in uh, I think it's in September is that right yeah so the if anybody else is going to do the fifth international conference on solar technologies and hybrid mini grids, um, I think we're presenting there and, and possibly have a, a small event there as well. So hopefully we can um, provide some updates at, around that event as well. Awesome. Thank you both so much for your time. Um, and thank you to uh, the participants. Um, thank you to uh, the EST team as well for organizing and supporting this really good work. And we look forward to um, following you very closely for updates. Um, Leah, anything else before we close? No, um, thank you for the conversation. And we have three more sessions, though we have, uh, like the second session is already halfway through, but we have two more sessions on solar dryers and also on decentralized renewable energy and its role in empl employment. And I've put the links in the chat, so hopefully you can join us there as well. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, everyone. Thanks for the questions. Bye. Thank, thank you. you. Bye. Thanks, Thanks so, so much, much. everyone. Bye. Bye.